my name is Luke Nichter, the James H. Cavanaugh Chair in Presidential Studies, Professor of History at Chapman University. And we're here at the Hoover Institution, where we've just come from a fascinating history working group seminar with my two guests today, uh, Dwight Chapin and Jeff Shepard. And Dwight and Jeff each worked in the Nixon White House. They are each authors of recent books and they joined me in the stimulating uh, seminar uh, at, where we got into some new evidence dealing with Watergate, which is just in time for this commemoration of the 50th anniversary uh, of Watergate, which continues between now and August of next year in 2024, uh, leading up to the 50th anniversary of Richard Nixon's resignation and, and his pardon by Gerald Ford. So welcome both of you, welcome to Hoover. Thank Terrific. you, good to Thank be here. You, Luke. Now, let's start with your books, since you each have a, a recent book. Uh, Dwight first, uh, give me a summary of your book. Why, why a book? Why a book? Well, my book is called The President's Man, and it's the memoirs of what my, uh, Nixon's trusted aide, and that was me. Uh, and I wrote this book. Most, most books are written, you know, six minutes after somebody leaves the White House. <laughs> I took 50 years to give some perspective to all of this, and I cover my, the journey that I had with Richard Nixon as a young man from age of 22 up through basically right now, because I still am out talking about the legacy of Richard Nixon. Uh, I talk about the journey, and particularly re in reference to uh, Watergate and some of the subjects we call, talked about today, I talk about what I know now that I did not know then. And you're too, probably too modest to suggest this, but I suspect that of everyone left with us, your relationship with Nixon probably goes back the furthest uh, and really are the last person who was closely associated with him. Is that fair to say? I, I think it's fair to say I was a very young man. I was a student at the University of Southern California when I first started working for him when he ran for governor in 1962. And then I ended up uh, moving to New York after he had moved there and became uh, his personal aide and worked with him all the way through until he became president of the United States. And then I became his appointment secretary. Jeff Shepard, in your case, we're talking about three books, so a larger corpus of work. How would you summarize that work to date? Well, the three books are all on Watergate. Uh, I joined the Nixon White House staff as the youngest lawyer, two weeks out of law school. I stayed for five years, and toward the end, I was deputy counsel on his Watergate defense team. As your viewers know, it ended badly. President Nixon resigned in disgrace, and two dozen members of his administration went to prison. Uh, we lost big time. I discovered uh, about 15 years ago that the records of the Watergate Special Prosecution Force are kept at our National Archives. And under certain circumstances, you can review them. <clears throat> I like to think I know what to ask for, and I know how to recognize something when it, the, the document seems to contradict conventional wisdom on Watergate. So I have these three books. Uh, the first one uh, describes how uh, the Watergate scandal was helped along by uh, Kennedy Democrats who wanted back in the White House. Uh, the second book uh, published in 2015 is, concentrates on how the uh, Watergate defendants did not get uh, fair trials or due process of law because of shortcuts taken by the prosecutors. And my most recent book, The Nixon Conspiracy, which came out in 2021, describes how Nixon himself uh, was brought down by falsehoods and misrepresentations made in secret to the Congress. So my, my whole rationale is uh, documents uh, because I think my story is so astounding it, it needs and it benefits from showing the actual documents that leave this paper trail. And you, I think you're, you also are too modest to say this, but I, I recall you were the youngest member on Nixon's, youngest attorney on Nixon's defense team. 
And so to your delight or perhaps horror, here you are 50 years later, you, re by, you, you really are the greatest living expert on the details having to do with Watergate. Well, that's true. Uh, it, it's also, I not only lived through it from stem to stern, but I've spent most of the last 15 years researching it. So there are others who, who were there, but their lives have gone on. <laughs> not He's mine. still living it. Every day, <laughs> every day. So let's fast forward and bring viewers up to today. So here we are 50 years later, and 50 years ago, uh, I mean, almost on a weekly, or in some cases, some weeks, a daily basis, we are commemorating some 50th anniversary of something, you know, as Watergate unfolded in 1973 yes. until the resignation in 1974. So for the next year plus, almost on a weekly basis, there's something we can look back and say, 50 years ago today, this happened. Um, so 50 years later, here we are. We've just come from this seminar. Um, why should we care? Well, one, uh, we, we really should have a correct understanding of what happened. So one of the things we did in the seminar, I produced a spiral brown notebook of some 19 documents for the uh, participants to study. We talked about some of them, but they can look through them. But my website contains references and links to 100 documents that indicate something was amiss. It was amiss then, and if we're not careful, if we're not astute, the same kind of situation can become a miss today. You get political prosecutions. Uh, uh, this is not politics and electoral uh, votes. This is deciding to put people in prison you don't like. And that can become very, very controversial. And I, I, I maintain that's what happened then. And you learn about that. You look at what's going on today. You might worry about the same sorts of things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Dwight Chapin, same question. 50 years later, why should we still be talking about this? It's incredibly important. Uh, Jeff's points are right on the money. You have to understand uh, the, the documentation and the nuances of all of this and what was done wrong. But I would add in to what Jeff said, the critical importance of understanding what was going on politically. And, and the juxtaposition of the powers that were after Richard Nixon. Nixon came in at a, a, a real high point in his political life. He had gone to China. He had had the salt talks in Russia. He had an incredible landslide victory with a 17 million margin against uh, George McGovern. I mean, he was riding incredibly high and there were oppositions to him that had tremendous power and harnessed together to come after him. Uh, and it, in, in all fairness, he, he, he was brought down by a conspiracy that was, uh, had, a, had, had the fundamental uh, base, if you will, of this mis- uh, uh, misuse prop, uh, judicial system, the misuse of the, the prosecutors, uh, uh, this uh, whole further, episode that, that, that Jeff describes so well. And that was kind of the, the culmination of this. I mean, he, he's up there, you know, how are they going to get him? And, and they get him by cheating. And what, what's so intriguing uh, from our perspective is that just within the last 10 years, four caches of documents have surfaced showing internal uh, deliberations by the special prosecution force that show they were having secret meetings with the judges, they were uh, suppressing exculpatory information, they were cutting so many corners that you can't in good faith claim that Nixon and his aides got the due process of law that they're promised by the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. And this unfolding, I believe it's just starting. There's so many more things to come out. Uh, if, you, if you understand how it unfolded then, you can look at documents, even 50 years later, 
and say, wow, if we had known that then, these things couldn't have happened. Uh, and then it, you come down to it, what is the major, what is the major way to prevent it? And, and you cling back to a free press. The real ace in the hole for the rule of law, which we're all, which we're all aligned with, requires a free and vibrant press. And for me, this we're talking about an academic subject. I was born after Watergate, but you two lived through this. I mean, is it possible to sort of think, what if back then we knew then what we know now? I mean, what are the ramifications of this? I mean, especially for me, a non-attorney, when you talk about sort of judicial misconduct and ex parte meetings and uh, prosecutors talking to judges and judges talking to people on the, the Irvin Committee, what does that all mean, you know, in terms of uh, help a non-attorney understand why that's so significant? But, well, you, but, be, uh, you begin with three truths, three un, un, unassailable truths. There really was a break-in. They were caught red-handed. The question was, who knew? There really was a cover-up. The question was, who was involved in the cover-up? And Nixon really did resign. So I complain about due process. It doesn't mean the people were innocent. It, I mean, they, I got my friends and my enemies and people I blame, but it means they didn't get a fair trial. And we guarantee our citizens by the Bill of Rights a fair trial. Try to say something. What, we, what we didn't know then that we now know is of interest, but what really needs to be underscored is that this kind of thing can happen and that we have to be vigilant, uh, vigilant uh, about it and that we need to make sure that we continue with a press that is vigilant and is on top of this kind of activity if it's happening and, and, and searches for the truth be the, be the press people Republican or Democrat. And uh, there, there, there's just a need uh, for, for an element of fairness here. Uh, Richard Nixon was an incredible man and a, a very distinguished person, a great president. And he was brought down by this and there is a complete, a complete uh, misunderstanding of what this man was all about. And I think one of the things that's happening here, thanks to Jeff and other work by others, it, it, that we're starting to understand that indeed he has a legacy that is much more important and much more sterling, if you will, uh, than, than the public has been led to believe. And this is very good for him because it's fair and accurate. And for me, you know, when I, when I look at some of these newly disclosed documents, it's an important lesson about various details about Watergate, but really, as I look at it from more of an academic standpoint and taking this into the classroom and how do I use, utilize some of this new content, it's almost to me appears to be a sort of case study for political warfare and how it yes. happens. And I say that because it could happen again. Uh, it could happen to a Democrat or a Republican. And here we have a, a, a very well-documented case for exactly how this happened. Now that this new documentation is coming out, do you agree with that take? I, mean, are you, I do. Did, and at the time, did you feel that this was political warfare? Yes. If you, if you don't have honest people and keep, pe keep people honest, you're going to have this kind of activity. And what, what Jeff has uncovered here is uh, a manipulation to bring down a president. And the, the motives of these people were such that uh, it has to throw into question whether the, our democratic process worked the way that it was supposed to work at that time. It's working now because we're back in there and thanks to people like Jeff and future historians coming along, we're going to get more and more of the truth. There's a tremendous amount of documents left to be reviewed. As you know so well, there are incredible number of tapes to be researched. So uh, it's, it, it, there, there's a lot of ground to be plowed here to find out even more than we know as, as of this time. And Jeff, you can have the last word here. Well, politics can be very rough and tumble. Uh, there's no question about that. People feel strongly in different points of view. 
But when prosecutions become politicized, alarm bells ought to go off because to, to, to twist uh, statutes in order to go get someone uh, is not the way our system was set up. And it turns out that's what was done in Watergate, and we didn't know about it because nobody in the press was willing to look into it. Today we have more diversity of views from the, from the media, but you've got the same risk when prosecutions become politicized. And I think that's the, uh, the alarm bell that we have to be mindful of. And if there's some truth, uh, any truth at all, uh, the 18 year olds in my classroom, um, they'll really be the next generation who tries to make sense of this. Uh, maybe even after I'm gone. <laughs> so <laughs> We wish them well. <laughs> I think we will still be learning about this subject for a very long time. Right? I agree. It was the dominant political uh, 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 challenge of the previous century, the political scandal. Uh, it, huge. Went on for three years. Lots of currents and eddies and differences of opinion and a ripe topic for study. So I, I think we'll end it right there. just want to say thank you to Dwight Chapin, Jeff Shepard, for joining me here today for uh, new revelations about Watergate at 50 uh, here at the History Working Group at the Hoover Institution.